uh, thank you again. Um, and uh, let's let's just get to it. Um, these are my disclosures. And um, I was told I needed to come with a fun fact. And so the fun fact uh, about me is I used to collect spiders as a child. Um, uh, I used to, uh, you know, not to kill them or anything like that, but I used to make a little terrarium, uh, like not, not unlike the one uh, pictured here. Um, and let them make a house and then catch insects and, and, uh, and, and feed them. Uh, and what can I say? Uh, I've, uh, I've been um, always interested uh, in observing nature. So uh, that's a little fun fact. Uh, and today uh, I hope to sort of uh, um, do th three things. One is to define immunotherapy. What is immunotherapy? Uh, I'm going to briefly summarize current benefits associated with immunotherapy and ovarian cancer. And then for the last third of the talk, I'm going to talk about um, uh, some promising approaches that are on the horizon. Uh, and so let's just get right to it. Uh, what is immunotherapy? Well, immunotherapy uh, is defined. This is a definition at uh, American Cancer Society. Uh, any treatment that uses the person's own immune system to fight cancer. And uh, in that, uh, immunotherapy is not just one type of cancer treatment, but it can be a number of different types of uh, treatments. Um, and I'll just briefly highlight some of these. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all, all of these uh, today, but adoptive T cell therapy is when immune cells are actually harvested from the body. They're expanded in the lab. They can be genetically modified, and then they're returned uh, to the patient uh, and so that they're kind of uh, super immune cells and can better uh, attack and, uh, and kill the cancer cells. Uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors are probably the most commonly used type of immunotherapy today. Um, these are um, uh, drugs that target uh, certain breaks on the immune system. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk, uh, most of my talk will be um, uh, talking about drugs that are in this class of immunotherapy these are basically drugs that take the breaks off the immune cells and, uh, and activate them. Uh, monoclonal antibodies are, uh, I'm gonna touch upon briefly. These are um, uh, molecules that allow drugs or immune cells to localize to a specific target. So they're kind of like the um, laser guided missile. It's the laser guidance system, which is the monoclonal antibodies. They can take uh, and, um, focus in uh, any sort of treatment to one uh, type of um, cell or cancer cell in the body. Cancer vaccines, I'm not really going to talk about um, uh, today. Uh, they, they've been tried uh, a lot and, um, you know, successes there has been a little bit more limited. Um, but now they're, they're, there's rejuvenation in cancer vaccines because of everything else that's going in the, on, in the immunotherapy field. And in cytokine therapy, you're going to hear uh, Omid Beza tomorrow. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, one type of uh, very innovative cytokine therapy where cells are programmed to release uh, cytokines inside the abdominal cavity directly in the environment of uh, ovarian cancer. And, uh, and so, as I mentioned, most of the talk is going to be about drugs that are uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. These are the so-called breaks on the immune cells. And drugs that allow us to lift these breaks. Uh, and some of these targets, some of these immune checkpoints are PD-1, PD-L1, and CTLA-4. And so by taking these breaks off, we, we can activate and enhance uh, uh, cancer killing uh, function of the immune cells. Uh, and first, I'm going to tell you the bad news. Uh, I think many of you uh, in the audience may, may have heard that, oh, immunotherapy is not working for ovarian cancer. And, and, you know, again, just as this is a very high level summary of the data, but uh, PD-1 and PD-L1 immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, only benefit about 10 or 15% of patients with ovarian cancer. Um, the objective response rate, which means any patients, um, what the percentage of patients who experience uh, shrinkage of the tumor less than 30% or complete disappearance of tumor is seven and a half to 15%. Another 20 to 40% of patients may get disease uh, esta uh, stabilization where the cancer is not shrinking, but it's also not growing. But again, that tends to be for a limited duration of time. And also, unlike some other cancers where 
PDL1 staining on the tumor can somehow, you know, somewhat predict who might benefit from these drugs and who might not. In ovarian cancer, there's very little evidence that PDL1 uh, positive tumors or negative tumors uh, really um, predict uh, success or benefit from immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, so if one immune checkpoint inhibitor isn't enough, what about combining? So I, I named uh, CTLA-4 as another immune checkpoint. And so um, there was a trial that was a randomized trial of testing NEVO alone versus IPI plus NEVO. And IPI and NEVO are just names of two um, immune checkpoint inhibitors. IPI targets CTLA-4 checkpoint, NEVO uh, and targets PD-1. And what you can see in, in these graphs, um, this is a survival graph, but for those of you who may, may not have uh, seen a lot of these, um, although I, I suspect uh, some of our, um, our earlier speakers probably uh, presented a lot of these figures, but basically on the y-axis is the percentage of patients that are event-free, and on the x-axis is time. And the events can be progression, or they can be uh, loss of life due to cancer. So overall survival or progression-free survival. And what you can see is the red dots or the red line, which is the combination of IPI and NEVO had a little bit better median progression. Uh, uh, first of all, better um, um, response rate of 31% versus 12%, uh, but also a little bit better um, median progression-free survival um, of 3.9 months versus two months. Um, however, uh, the overall survival, which is the graph that's shown on the right-hand side, was not that different. Um, so there was that, that was not significantly different, even though it looks like the red line is more to the right. So combination checkpoints haven't really been the answer yet either. Um, but when, when these drugs, when immunotherapy uh, showed that it could work in cancer, the hope was that, okay, we have our current weapons, which are mainly chemotherapy for ovarian cancer. And the current weapons allow us to shift the survival curve to the right. So if on this graph, you compare the dark blue line with the green line, the green line is, uh, is meant to show benefit from chemotherapy so that more patients um, get um, um, benefit, and so more are alive at any given uh, time uh, during treatment. And with immune uh, checkpoint inhibitors, you can see the purple line where a smaller portion of patients benefit, but that benefit tends to be more durable. And so the idea or the hope was that by combining chemotherapy and immunotherapy, we can reach the red line. So we can have more patients getting benefit for a longer period of time. And, um, and so as you can see from the title of this slide, uh, there's a question mark. So this uh, has not um, proven to be what, what we'd hoped, at least in ovarian cancer. And I'm just gonna show you some examples. This isn't meant to be going through every study that was ever done. This was a study of a, uh, in, in the recurrent ovarian cancer setting where patients received either doxel, which is a chemotherapy that's used for patients with recurrent uh, ovarian cancer, uh, or abelumab, which is a pdl one targeting immune checkpoint inhibitor, um, or patients got a combination of the two drugs. And so it was a randomized three-arm study. And... Um, I'll just show you the progression-free survival curve. As you can see, uh, the patients that got either the doxel, PLD stands for doxel, that's the green line, were no different uh, in terms of progression-free survival compared to those that got abelumab plus the doxel. Uh, and uh, the group that got just abelumab actually did considerably worse. Um, and so in, in, this, in this study, uh, in a recurrent uh, ovarian cancer setting, combining chemotherapy with immune checkpoint inhibitors um, was, was not, uh, did, did not result in additional benefit. And other studies have shown this with other immune checkpoint inhibitors as well. So maybe the answer is not to try to introduce immunotherapy in the recurrent setting. What if we uh, add immunotherapy to our best 
uh, line of treatment, which is the front line of treatment. This was another uh, study which was actually led by Dr. Moore. Um, and uh, in this study, patients got either uh, standard chemotherapy, which was a combination of carboplatin, uh, paclitaxel, which is taxol, and bevacizumab, which is also known as avastin, or they got these drugs plus a, an anti pdl one immune checkpoint inhibitor that's called atezolizumab. And, and so it was a straight randomized trial. And um, again, uh, looking at the outcomes, the uh, graph on the left shows the progression-free survival in the overall population. Um, and the, the, these lines, as you can see, are pretty much inter, interposed. Uh, um, on the right-hand side, for the population that were pd one positive, maybe there was a little bit of benefit, you know, maybe two months benefit in the patients that got the four-drug combination, but uh, this wasn't uh, nearly as, as much of a benefit as anybody um, had hoped. Um, so uh, introducing immunotherapy uh, in, in the frontline setting also um, has not resulted uh, in, in benefit. So right about now, I'm sure everybody in the audience is thinking, uh, is there any good news about immunotherapy for ovarian cancer? And uh, trust me, I wouldn't be here if, if, uh, if I didn't feel that there was, and I'm gonna tell you why. So I'm gonna share with you uh, several reasons for optimism. And the first one is that we're currently using first generation immunotherapy drugs. What do I mean by that? Well, I talked about PD-1, pd one and CTLA-4. These are just the beginning. So these are just the initial immune checkpoint uh, uh, um, um, targets that were, that were targeted by, um, um, by antibodies that can interfere, uh, interfere with these pathways. But in fact, there are a large number of other immune checkpoints, these breaks on the immune cells. And then there are also gas pedals or accelerators on the immune cells as well. And these can all be potential targets for manipulation or immunomodulation so that we can uh, get more, uh, more activation of immune cells. Um, this this um, figure is actually already quite overdated. I, I just outdated, uh, I just use it because all of the targets fit on one slide. Um, so uh, there's a, a large number of targets. And just so you see that I'm, this isn't just hand waving and I'm not just trying to uh, kind of uh, uh, create um, a false hope that some, some of this is bound to work. Uh, in melanoma, it was already uh, shown that combination of anti-PD-1 drug with a LAG-3 drug. So you see the LAG-3 here in the middle of the screen. Um, uh, these two drugs uh, in melanoma where most immunotherapy gets its beginning um, has shown to be much better than the PD-1 drug alone with uh, very acceptable toxicity. And so uh, that's an example of hopefully where we can get some successes and also in ovarian cancer. Uh, the other um, aspect of uh, you know, us being in the infancy of immunotherapy is now we can engineer uh, um, antibodies. I described antibodies earlier in the talk as the la laser guidance or homing uh, mechanism for various uh, drugs. Um, the, uh, these antibodies can be connected to a, uh, a chemotherapy drug. Uh, those are called antibody drug conjugates. And there's been a lot of uh, recent successes in ovarian cancer with antibody drug conjugates uh, uh, targeting various cell surface targets on ovarian cancer cells and bringing the drug to the ovarian cancers. In immunotherapy, there's a similar concept where bites or um, bispecific T cell engagers can be used. And this is shown here uh, on the right-hand side with, uh, with a little green and blue diagram. Uh, you can see that the green side of this bite attaches to CD3, which is a marker on the surface of T cells that are, are uh, major immune cells that fight cancers. Uh, and then the blue side attaches to the surface of the cancer cells. The TAA stands for tumor-associated antigen. And so these molecules can be engineered to bring the immune system to their targets and 
and make them uh, more efficient killers of cancer cells. Well, we can not only engineer uh, um, antibodies, we can actually engineer whole immune cells. And um, you know, some of the examples include CAR T cells and CAR NK cells, where uh, regular immune cells are genetically modified to specifically rec recognize a specific cancer-associated target. Uh, these uh, cells are then expanded outside of the body and they're returned to the patient where um, there's been a huge success story in B-cell leukemias and lymphomas uh, with the CAR T cells and they're now commercially approved products available for those patients. Um, I'm just gonna share with you a little bit of preclinical data uh, from a, a um, colleague of mine at MD Anderson, Dr. Katie Resvani. Uh, she is interested in NK cells because NK cells what, uh, can be um, derived from uh, human cord blood. So umbilical cord blood can be a source of NK cells. Uh, and uh, so uh, patients can receive this type of treatment, uh, so-called off the shelf. They don't need to donate their own immune cells for genetic manipulation. These uh, immune cells can be prepared uh, from, from uh, NK cells that are present in cord blood. Uh, these are um, animal studies where um, on the left-hand side, um, I, I should first uh, mention that in this experiment, tumor cells have been stained with a fluorescent dye. And the, the animals, uh, the little uh, white things are little mice, and they're photographed with a special camera that can see fluorescence. And um, so in the beginning, the top row is when a tumor was introduced into the mice on so day five, um, patients had roughly equal amounts of tumor in the abdominal cavity. And on the left-hand side are patients that just had that intervention. You can see that over time, from days 11 through 55, there's increased tumor growth. Um, the NT column are animals that got just the NK cells that were not genetically modified. You can see that these animals did a little bit better, but over time, the cancer still grew. And then the last two columns on the right-hand side are animals that receive genetically engineered NK CAR, T cell, uh, NK CAR cells. And you can see that, um, that there was a lot less tumor in these animals uh, showing effectiveness of this type of immunotherapy. So this is really exciting. Uh, and we're hoping to have uh, the first clinical trial for ovarian cancer uh, using this treatment uh, in less than a year. Um, another reason for optimism is learning from what is working. And I'm gonna just uh, give you two uh, quick anecdotes. One is a benefit of immune checkpoint inhibitors in clear cell ovarian cancer, which is a particularly difficult subtype of ovarian cancer to treat because clear cells uh, tend to be more chemo resistant. And then I'm gonna talk about synergy between tyrosine kinase inhibitors um, or um, otherwise um, uh, drugs that are uh, uh, targeting the anti-angiogenic uh, pathway. Uh, they're uh, preventing cancers from making new blood vessels, which is called angiogenesis. Uh, these are drugs like um, um, bevacizumab, and, and there are now a number of oral uh, drugs that work by similar mechanisms as well. And this is uh, just from uh, our uh, preliminary results from an ongoing trial where we're treating patients with ovarian clear cell cancer uh, with, um, with immunotherapy with combination of CTLA-4 and pdl one targeting drugs. Um, as you can see, what, what we found is that patients that have a certain mutation in a gene that's called PPP2R1A, these patients have a lot better overall survival compared to those patients uh, whose tumors does not carry this mutation. Now, I will tell you that this mutation um, inactivates this, this protein, this PP2R1A, and it's unfortunately only ten, present in 10% of clear cells. Clear cells are roughly 10% of ovarian cancers. And so this is basically uh, something that's benefiting only 1% of patients with ovarian cancer. And so you might say, well, why do we care about something that benefits only 1% of patients with ovarian cancer? Well, what we're, interest, we're interested in this target because the mutations are rare, but there is a drug 
that can uh, inactivate the same, same pathway. And so we're hoping that that drug will be uh, similar in benefit uh, to um, as if the patient's tumor had a mutation. Uh, and of course, the benefit of that drug is we can apply that drug and test that drug in all the patients that don't have the, the uh, PP2R1A mutation, the other 99% of patients with ovarian cancer. And so we're, we're um, working on a trial that's going to look at, uh, at this uh, drug uh, combination with immunotherapy. We're going to start in clear cells, but if that looks promising, we're going to expand it to other subtypes of ovarian cancer as well. Another uh, thing that's working is not too long ago, endometrial cancer results with immunotherapy were very similar to what I showed you at the beginning of the talk in ovarian cancer. Uh, pembrolizumab, which is one of the anti-PD-1 drugs, had only benefited about 10% of patients, response rate in 10% of patients, and that's shown in the graph. Here, the bar bars that are going up, that means tumor is growing from baseline. The bars that are going down, that means tumors that are shrinking from baseline. And again, to be considered a response, uh, it has to, uh, the tumor has to shrink by at least uh, negative 30%. So um, the graph on the right, you can see the response rate is 36%, much better. And that is co combining pembrolizumab with lemvatinib, which is one of those oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor drugs that I was mentioning. So this combination proved to be much better uh, and benefit many more patients than just the Pembro by itself. And, and so, you know, this kind of shows us that even though Pembro by itself wasn't that effective, a combination was able to rescue, rescue that ineffectiveness. And in fact, there's some data in ovarian cancer that the same, uh, same type of benefit from this type of combination can be seen. This was a study that was presented uh, about two years ago and um, it's notable that uh, response rates with lemvatinib and pembrolizumab were 32%. Remember that uh, uh, pembrolizumab by itself only has a response rate of about 10% in ovarian cancer. So this is uh, clearly much better and it's going in the right direction. This other paper uh, took uh, a bevacizumab or a Bastin, uh, added pembrolizumab, and then they added an oral chemotherapy drug called cytoxan. And this three-drug combination um, was really exciting because what they saw was uh, in the right-hand side, uh, you can see that uh, 19 out of the 40 patients, so 47.5% of the patient population responded. Uh, and uh, equally uh, impressive was that in those patients that were platinum or chemo resistant, that's the middle column, you can see that responses were seen in those patients as well. 43.3% of those patients were responders. And uh, like many drugs, a uh, little bit better responses in platinum sensitive patients, but uh, the numbers here were um, really small, so should be interpreted with caution. Another uh, key observation in this study was that those patients that had received fewer prior lines of chemotherapy tended to have a better progression-free survival. And so you can see the blue line uh, on, on this graph are, uh, is the progression-free survival of patients that had three or fewer lines of prior chemotherapy, whereas the red, uh, yellow line shows you patients that uh, were um, had uh, more than three lines of therapy. And, um, and then lastly, I'm gonna just uh, briefly, I know we're coming up on time. I'm gonna tell you that, um, you know, uh, we, we think that focusing on minimal residual disease in ovarian cancer is important. Uh, we recently uh, have uh, uh, partnered with uh, five other institutions uh, um, uh, to, to really use the strategy to see if we can transform outcomes in ovarian cancer. Um, this is a graph of a number of cancer cells uh, during uh, over time in the body. And you can see that the number of cancer cells increases until it re reaches the blue hash mark, that blue hash line 
uh, represents initial diagnosis. And then of course, treatment starts, that number decreases. And uh, for some patients it becomes zero. So some patients are cured. Unfortunately for patients with advanced ovarian cancer, this number is nowhere near as high enough that we'd like to see it. And then on the right-hand side of the graph, you can see that eventually the number of cells increases and even goes beyond the uh, time of diagnosis and represents clinical relapse. But in between the left and right-hand sides of this graph is the, is the time where the cancer is low enough where it can still be detected, but not using the usual clinical methods. And that uh, phase of the disease is called minimal residual disease or MRD, and we're interested in intervening at this time. And so, of course, the problem with ovarian cancer is that our frontline treatment works really well, but unfortunately, most patients with advanced disease experience a recurrence. And this pattern hasn't changed really over the last 45 years. We've now shown that we can identify this minimal residual disease after frontline treatment surgically. And about 50% of patients that don't have any evidence of cancer by CA125 tumor marker or um, a CT scan, if we do a, a, a minimally invasive second look operation on them, we can identify microscopic disease. We know those patients that have microscopic disease have worse outcomes, and why not intervene at this point? What, uh, and, and what we're hoping to do is use the biopsies that are performed during these operations to better understand why is this 1% of the tumor left behind? What, and what are the uh, biological adaptations that allow this tumor to uh, survive six or more cycles of chemotherapy and surgery? And so the idea is that over time, as uh, um, we go from pretreatment biopsy to debulking surgery biopsy to uh, evidence of minimal residual disease at a second look surgery, that uh, ch biological changes that result in chemo resistance are uh, increased over that time. And so by catching the disease at its uh, minimal residual phase, which is currently undetectable, then maybe we can learn um, a lot about the mechanisms of resistance. And we're going to look at uh, genetic mechanisms. We're going to look at changes in the immune environment. And we're going to look at developing a blood test that maybe someday we can offer patients so they don't have to undergo a second operation. We can just tell from the blood test what's going on with the minimal residual disease. So in summary, uh, there are currently no FDA-approved immunotherapies for patients with ovarian cancer. Uh, I showed you that some combinations, including antiangiogenic drugs and immune checkpoint blockers, appear to increase benefit. Uh, and there are several promising approaches, important reasons to stay optimistic and hopeful that are currently being evaluated in clinical trials. Um, and I just want to thank Overcome for the invitation and thank you all for your attention and the opportunity to share uh, this exciting area of cancer treatment with you all. Thank you so much.